Thank you very much for the introduction. I understand, understood that the beginning only Friedrich Janum, Bundeskunstler, Petri Tanilai. That's, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. But the second time I understood a bit more and I'm very sure that uh, you explained everything already which I'm gonna talk about. Thank you very much, Adrian, for inviting me here. Thank you very much, Goethe Institute, for also enabling this. And uh, it's a full house here, so uh, I'm very impressed by that. And uh, I will sit down a bit later. I hope you will still see me. But uh, otherwise, uh, you have to ask me, and I will get up again and see that I will, uh, will present myself to you still a bit uh, acclimatizing myself, so uh, it's still a bit hot and cold, etc. But uh, this, year, this summer in Germany also, we are pretty much uh, used to that so in that sense. But it's a specific climate here. And I am now, since about uh, two days here in uh, Albania, I visited uh, Tirana yesterday, which was very interesting. And also interesting for me because uh, Probably I might do something with uh, uh, subject matter from Albania in the future. Something I will research when I go back and uh, I try and keep in touch with uh, Albanian people. So for me it's uh, already a success to be here and I hope that uh, my talk will also be a success for you because that's what it's all about tonight, I guess. I will present you some experience I had in the four institutions I, uh, I was working in up till now, some uh, experience I had with performance, with performance art. And specifically because I think that uh, today it's very important to give space to performance art in an institution. Because I have the feeling that we need to change the institutions in a way. We need, and this is kind of a word from uh, from uh, economics, we need kind of a change manage management. And I have the feeling that the best people to help a curator and museum director to help him with change management are the artists themselves. And this is what I tried to do most of my career. And I want to give you a few examples of the way how artists, by performing the institution, were also changing the institution and gave me the possibility to work with the institution as was needed in this, uh, in this uh, era. And this is something uh, also uh, towards my colleagues I always try to uh, speak about in terms of uh, making clear that the way goes via the artists and that it's not only something which as a museum director you're able to shape by yourself. It's the important premise but the important uh, starting point before I um, start with the rest of my, uh, of my performance in between brackets. So up till now, the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn is my fourth institution. I started in the 90s in Zurich with Migra Museum and uh, that's where I found out how to do this how to try and work with artists who are able to change the institution by performing. But before I show Migro, I show something which I did in 2008. And uh, that's an exhibition in the, in the second last institution I was directing, the Kunsthalle Friedrichianum in Kassel, the mother house of Documenta, as you might know, the house in which uh, every five years, the state of the art, so to say, on a very multifaceted level is presented. I was directing the institution Friedrichianum, the oldest museum building on the European continent, the oldest building which was explicitly built as a museum on the European continent in 1779. Friedrichianum, a neoclassical institution, neoclassical building. And um, when I was uh, taking over there after the Documenta of 2007, after the Documenta by Roger Burgel, I took it over and my first exhibition in 2008 was probably also my most important exhibition in that institution. It was an exhibition with Christoph Büchel, with a Swiss artist, and he brought the Museum Friedrichianum back to its meaning. 
He changed the institution as after a few, after some months, I understood why it was possible and why it was needed to change it in that way. He showed the Friedrichshafen as a museum, which is not a museum anymore. He tried to show the Friedrichshafen in a state of deterioration, in a state in which the museum is losing his function, in a state in which economy thinks that it is not necessary to give any more subsidy to a cultural institution and thinks that probably we can make more money when we do something else with the building. The oldest public museum building on the European continent. And when you see the building like this, you notice a few things which are uncommon, untypical for the Friedrichshafen as we used to know it. First of all, we see those small um, those the small woods here uh, in front, the small forest of trees here in front of the building. I will say something about that a bit later. Then we see a police car uh, at the left side, and the police car was standing, was parked next to the building during the whole exhibition, three months, three or four months. The police car was kind of an object in the exhibition. And then we see on the building, we see two big banners in which we see a P, a blue P. And when you make, when you reverse this P for 180 degrees, you might see the D, which was the logo of the first documenta in 1955. The blue D, documenta one, it wasn't called Documenta Bond because it was not supposed to be a series, but the first Documenta had that logo, and Christoph Buschel kind of reversed it and made something out of it. The P was standing for Politica, a fair for political parties, which I will show a few pics of when we go a bit further. And on the center you see something which is called McGuides. This is the logo of a discounter shop in the east of Germany, and this was also taking, taking possession, so to say, of the Friedrichshafen during that whole exhibition. Also, the place in front of the Friedrichshafen was changed by Christoph Büchel. He decided to turn it into kind of an agricultural area on which a farmer was able to use the Friedrichsplatz which is a, a, a place which is very important for documenta always. always. And uh, like in Kassel, the city which suffered at the end most from the uh, Second World War, because it was one of the cities with the biggest weapon industry in Germany, you see there is also an old uh, bomb lying there, and there was a, a silo put over the statue of Friedrich, who is normally standing there, uh, in front of the Friedrich Channel. He's still standing there, but he was hidden underneath this uh, agricultural silo. So the Friedrichsplatz was not the Friedrichsplatz anymore. The Friedrichsplatz changed and was given back to the people, was given back to a farmer, was given away from its representational function of being a place for military parades during Second World War also, and it was changed into something different. And I zoom in a bit on the facade again, and we see how in front of the entrance, we see those uh, items from a super discounter, those uh, shop items which uh, point at the direction that the museum is not a museum anymore. And um, we see this uh, construction site sign next to the building, on which, it's, which is written in German, uh, Museum Friedrichshafen, reconstruction of the East Wing. So in, we see that it's assigned by the um, Bundesagentur für Arbeit, by the, uh, by the labor um, agency and by the city of Kassel. And uh, um, we see the EU logo as a fake logo in terms of uh, the one who gives the assignment for it. And it's about uh, showing a picture of how the Friedrich Channel will look in the future. And the whole exhibition was meant to be like a uh, way of using the Friedrich Channel in between. 
before the construction, the reconstruction was starting. So it was rented as a, as a place for a, uh, for a super discounter, as I told you, at the entrance hall and the hall behind it, uh, the space behind it. Uh, you, had, you could shop, you had to shop, you had to buy a ticket for the exhibition there also, you had to find, you could find the catalog also somewhere in the exhibition, in, uh, of the exhibition somewhere in the, uh, in between the, the, the products. And it was the, it was the real entrance to the Friedrichiano for four months. And this discounter was a real discounter and they were working together with us. So Christoph Bücher, after long discussions, after long negotiations with those people, he was able to persuade them to take part of it. And they also made their, they opened the store and the shop as a real shop opening. And they put flyers in all the, in all the uh, briefcases of, uh, of people's uh, houses in the, in the area there in Kassel. And when you went a bit further, you had something which is very specific for these kind of German cities like Kassel. You had this kind of uh, Spielcasino, as it's called, this kind of game uh, center, uh, which is very uh, defining the, uh, let's say, the Fußgänger zone, the uh, pedestrian zones of German cities uh, on the level of Kassel. Bücher was making an eye-winking, an ironizing, so to say, about the German pedestrian culture, in a way. And in the center, in the rotunda of the castle, there was a, a Christmas tree. It was summer, it was autumn, but there was a big Christmas tree of uh, 20, no, about 12 or 60 meters high, I think. And around it, he put uh, the advertisement, like in a soccer stadium. You see, you see Allianz, Telecom, and, uh, and the others. So he changed the whole building, the, the oldest museum building on the European continent, into a commercial building, into a commercial site. Uh, there was a solarium and there was a fitness center, <laughs> which could be used on certain hours of the day. And there was one door leading to nothing that was written on it, uh, the Islamic center of Kassel. Uh, this is interesting because in 2008, Islamic Center Kassel was not as big a topic as it would be now. When we see what's happening in Germany, when we see what's happening in Europe, and when we see what are the, the, the consequences of the, the refugee um, situation, in, specifically in Germany also, is that we see the rise of populism. We see the rise of, uh, of right-wing populism. We see the rise of, uh, of uh, what we call <coughs> Fremdenfeindlichkeit, uh, uh, let's say hostility against strangers and against immigrants. And uh, what happened in Chemnitz uh, the beginning of this week, in which there was a, a huge mob like uh, like trying to 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 send to, to get rid of the of the of the immigrants, so to say, in a way, this old, this one small piece of these letters on those uh, on this door, Islamic Center Castle, which is closed and there's nothing happening behind there, is kind of something which is a vision, probably in terms of what might happen at some point of time. And uh, the museum wing, what was still looking as a museum wing was uh, in, the, in a desolated state in which showcases were, uh, were um, damaged. There was a, a, a dead dove lying there on the right side. We had an empty uh, storage, uh, um, storage room in which uh, only some, uh, some labels were still hanging, but the paintings were gone. We had an office uh, of the uh, of the so-called concierge of the of the museum, which is all built in by by Bücher, which was not there yet, that, but something to just mystifying the museum as a museum in a way. And there was also the the the, the apartment of the concierge uh, in terms of uh, um, a very let's say uh, German apartment, as you imagine some kind of German apartment to look. To to, 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 to to kind of uh, come into appearance. It was um, as German as could be, in a way, this apartment. And this was also a part of the museum situation because also the museum was not needed anymore. And uh, when we went upstairs, there was a, a huge bar. 
And in this bar, there was a huge bowling um, track. And on this bowling track, there was a huge amount of, uh, let's say, uh, pieces of paper. And uh, this was a reconstruction of the way. And this is something which is also interesting for Albanian people, I think. This is something which, after the, uh, after, uh, the wall came down in Berlin, and after the uh, the reunification of uh, of uh, Germany, uh, in which uh, the whole uh, spying system of the Staatssicherheit in uh, in uh, in the GDR, the Stasi, in which all the dossiers were just before the wall came down, they were just destroyed by hand, and uh, there was in Germany an office, uh, a federal office, in which. They tried to put together again those uh, those puzzles uh, of paper in order to make those dossiers like the dossiers again, and uh, this is still going on. This uh, this work still going on, partly by hand, but also now partly by a computer system. And they started to do this on the on uh, let's say in the on the leisure zone of the free time zone of the ministry. Um, of, of one of the old ministries of the Staatssicherheit in, um, in Berlin. So Christoph Bücher kind of invented the bowling track, but basically the bowling track was a metaphor of the leisure zone because the offices were still kind of sealed. So it was a reconstruction of a German trauma in, uh, in a way. And uh, I just go through a bit, uh, a bit faster. Um, there were also, he built in those toilets and where there were like uh, uh, garbage bags filled with those pieces of paper and uh, he built uh, kind of this, uh, this room in which uh, bags with paper, puzzle, uh, puzzle pieces of paper were uh, lying and uh, where people could, you could see pieces of paper like dossiers uh, lying there on the tabletop with the names blackened out in order so that you could see again what uh, was put together, which is really like it's so what, still what's going on. In those bags? Sorry? In those bags? In those bags there were still those pieces of paper which were still waiting to put together. There are, uh, I, I don't remember how much there are, but there is a huge amount of those, I think there were 17,000 of those bags in Magdeburg and uh, somewhere near Nuremberg in two centers in which they were working on like uh, putting history uh, back to order again, so to say, and making transparent what happened. And then there was a zone, and this is the most performative zone of the exhibition, this was the Politica. This was uh, a fair, like uh, a fair for, for political parties in order to present themselves. And Christoph Büchel and us, we invited all the political parties in Germany to take to, to, to participate in this fair of political parties, in this Politica. And 36 of them uh, agreed to come. And uh, this is uh, what the fair looked like. Um, also, the most important parties uh, decided to come. But um, after one party also decided to participate, and that is the, uh, the right, uh, that's the neo-Nazi party, NPD, the other parties, the, the, the Bundestag parties, the, the governing parties, in uh, the parties who are also uh, present in the parliament, they decided not to come at the end. So they decided a few days before they wouldn't come because the NPD was there. And this was a, a big problem for me as a museum director, because what are you doing when this neo-Nazi party is, uh, is uh, presenting itself with its anti immigrant um, uh, ideas, propaganda, and at the same time the most important parties uh, uh, step back from their participation. And uh, so I went to the, to the mayor of Kassel and to the minister of Hessen and uh, they backed me up in, because the whole system is like the system is in Germany. Also these parties get tax money to make their propaganda at the end. A political party can get when they have a certain amount of members, they can get uh, funding for their party. And also, the extreme right-wing NPD was receiving tax money. So Bücher said, when we invite all the parties, we need to invite those parties also, because we need to make clear 
the, uh, the democratic system. It was a big discussion. It was uh, also my uh, employees. I was, I was non-German. It was my first show I did in Germany. And I, I'm, I'm Dutch. I was born in Holland. Uh, and my German uh, employees, uh, they came to me and they said, we don't want this party in our building. We don't want this party in the oldest uh, public museum building in, 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 in the, on the European continent. And we don't want the police to be coming to protect this party against uh, the anti-fascist. But at the end, we did it. And uh, we had uh, a lot of people going through during two days through those uh, this fair about uh, 15,000 people, and then the rest of the show, this fair was like the remnants of, uh, of the fair and was like uh, what was still lying around in terms of uh, papers, in terms of propaganda material, etc., etc. And there was also this, uh, this uh, space for uh, every party to do a presentation, a 15 minutes presentation. Um, with all the, the flags of the German federal countries and with the German and the European flag behind. So really like, uh, like such a convention um, uh, room is, is, is made. It was kind of a copy of existing uh, convention rooms and also this uh, representer of the, uh, of the NPD, of the Neo-Nazi party, had his 15 minutes of, uh, of fame on that, uh, on that podium, which was it brought, brought us in a real difficult situation, but at the end it made clear that with this whole thing, we had found a way to uh, renew the thinking about the value of a museum and about how a museum is necessary to, to protect us against those things and how we should go on in lobbying for cultural funding and for, uh, for, for continuing um, the let's say the traditional uh, the traditional uh, Bildungsbürger tomb, the traditional uh, idea of the intellectual who is uh, fighting for his rights and is uh, is positioning um, the cultural institutions. And at the end of this politica, uh, all the uh, all the political all the, the the representatives of the political parties who were uh, present were invited to plant a small tree for peace by the artist. Like just before in Kyoto, there was a kind of a, a demonstrative planting of small trees for the climate by the world leaders. And uh, when you see this picture, and also the next picture, you see very proud politicians standing in front of their tree. They made it. They were able to plant this tree for peace. And at the same time, they were completely instrumentalized by the artist for, for his ideology of trying to, uh, to uh, make aware of a new kind of thinking about cultural institutions. I mean, they were instrumentalized to participate in a fair which was not a fair, but was, was an artistic project and which was, a, which was an exhibition. And as from that moment, I knew that um, you work together with politicians, you lobby with politicians, and at the same time, when it goes to the, to the core of the matter, you have to find ways not to be instrumentalized as a museum by politics, but to do it the other way around. And, uh, to, uh, and this is what you need an artist for. And this is what you can do as a, as, a, as, a, as a museum director yourself. I could not go out on the street and uh, invite um, the neo-Nazi party to, be, uh, to participate in a fair for political parties in a German museum. I could only do it because the, because the, uh, the artist asked me to do this and made it part of his concept and part of his project and part of his proposal to do it. And, uh, as a curator, you don't do everything what an artist asks you to do. But if the arguments are right at the end, then uh, I think there is it's very sensible to do it because you believe from the beginning in the artistic quality which you want to show in that building. And I think that uh, the institution was performed by the artist. It was not a performance as a performance. It was not a performance as, a, as just an art performance. 
but it was a performance which was performing and resetting the institution in a way. And as from that moment, uh, we had a lot of uh, publicity. We, we were in the uh, hot topic in terms of discussion, and this was good for the institution. Because when you're in Kassel and you're starting the Friedrich Charnum after the documenta, it's always difficult because you get the idea of comparing. And when the documenta gets 800,000 people and the first show in your institution gets 5,000 people, this is uh, something uh, on a political level which is not easy to cope with. But because of this, we got 25,000 people, which was a, a, a good number for this. And uh, so we were able to reset the institution. This is what it's neat. And this is what I call like uh, believing in artistic freedom. Um, which functions at the moment that you're able to invite an artist uh, and to believe in an artist and to be able to also um, um, value his, uh, his artistic quality from the beginning. So it's about building up a relationship with an artist and then you can go the whole way with the artist when it comes to those kind of uh, activities and those kind of proposals. Another just shortly, an exhibition of uh, Matthias Faltbakken, which was also in the Friedrich Channel, Norwegian artist, uh, who showed uh, two years later, three years later, than Christoph Bucher. This exhibition, which looked like a perfect painting exhibition, <coughs> perfect minimal art painting exhibition, very straight, very straightforward, perfectly symmetrical in this symmetrical kind of uh, structure of the Friedrich Channel. Um, you saw only that the floor was a bit whitish, and uh, something happened there. And uh, you uh, you could see the paintings a bit. Uh, uh, you could walk to the paintings and uh, watch them. And you saw at the one painting, you saw that the paintings were uh, garbage bags. They were blue Norwegian garbage bags, like with uh, and they were they were written uh, they were written letters on it uh, with uh, adding. Um, with an adding marker, and on the left one there was something you only almost can't read it, but it was something like when z becomes, and then it it stops. For me, this was uh, something like uh, uh, a, a, a reinvention of the idea of the show of Harald Zeman when attitudes become forms, when z become. Um, becomes nothing, I think it's, uh, it, it should be. It becomes, it's like when the opposite of attitude, when, when nothing happens, when uh, nihilism, which is very important for Faltbach, becomes a standard, then uh, you have the antidote, so to say, of, uh, of change. And on the other hand, WWTF, into, instead of uh, North, East, South, West, WWTF. I asked him a bit later, what, what exactly does it mean? He said, I don't know, what, what the fuck or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> a very anti-show in that sense, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And uh, then you went around the corner, there was a second space also with uh, plain things, also with those garbage bags, but they were not all, all of them framed anymore, they were lying around. And uh, the floor was very white, white powder. And then you saw the left part, you saw this, uh, the clue to the exhibition, in a way. You saw this uh, fire extinguisher lying on the floor. And this gave you the clue that, to the idea that uh, there must have been a performance which had taken place to make the exhibition the exhibition. And uh, this is not part of the show. This is. Uh, uh, just a photo I could shoot on the evening before we uh, we opened the show in which Matthias Faltbacher was kind of destroying his exhibition with the fire extinguisher as a kind of juvenile, uh, puberal kind of uh, action in terms of uh, destroying uh, something which you've made yourself, um, like, uh, like some kind of rock musician who uh, who thinks of trying to, to destroy his setting before he starts or after he did his gig. And uh, 
it was a, another way of performance art which was only visible in the background and which was not at the end part of the exhibition, only the result of the performance was a part of the exhibition. Performance as an extended uh, moment in the creation of the artwork. Not taking place in the artist's studio, but taking place in the museum room itself, so to say. And the last show I show at, uh, at of the Friedrichianum, before I go to the other uh, venues I was uh, mentioning you before, I should watch the time a bit. That's a show by Jan Vo. That was my last show in the uh, in the Friedrichianum, and with Christoph Bücher I gave him the whole building to use, and also with Jan Vo, Vietnamese. Danish artist, I gave him the whole building to, to use and I told him I expect you to come up with a lot of empty space because Jan Vo was quite famous for leaving a lot of room empty and for coming up with small, uh, let's say, intercultural uh, <coughs> objects. Also thematizing for a part his, uh, his, his own biography as a as a refugee coming from uh, Vietnam and being found on a boat and brought to Denmark when he was uh, young, together with his family. And what he did, he came three months, four months before the opening of the show, he came to me and he said, Ryan, I want to make the biggest work possible. And I don't want to keep the, the leave the Freedom Channel empty, I want to make the biggest show, the biggest art piece possible. And I said, what's it going to look like? He said, it's going to be the Statue of Liberty. I said, how big? He said, as big as the real Statue of Liberty. I said, uh, this is impossible. Yeah, he said, in parts, like the original Statue of Liberty, which was also made in parts in France and being transported in parts to New York as a gift by the French uh, government to the, to the USA. And uh, it was all, it seemed to be impossible. But he found funding for that uh, in the two months uh, after that, and uh, the piece was uh, constructed in China. We found a producer in China to, uh, to make it on a, on a more or less economically sensible uh, level. And uh, uh, it was, uh, we, we were able to construct uh, like, uh, like, Almost half of the of the whole of all the elements of the of the Statue of Liberty, and uh, shipped it uh, to uh, to to Kassel, and we put it up there, just like uh, a big sculpture park, in terms of pieces of the Statue of Liberty. And I mean, it was the biggest piece possible for him, but it was also a piece which has a very strong connection to Kassel because probably you know Kassel uh, from documentaries, and probably you know the big uh, uh, Hercules sculpture, which is on the Wilhelmshöhe uh, um, hill, which is overlooking Kassel. And this uh, was made in the same technique as the, uh, as the Statue of Liberty, and was also an example in terms of technique for the Statue of Liberty. And the museum Friedrichianum was built by uh, by uh, Friedrich, by Frederick, who was also sending his soldiers as uh, uh, as soldiers for for hire, soldiers for sale, to the American Independence War in the same years. So he kind of made his money with the uh, American Independence War, and at the same time financed uh, the building of the Friedrich Channel by this, and. The Statue of Liberty was a gift from the uh, French to the Americans about 100 years after the, the, the independent war. So there was a very interesting research collection between those different, um, those, those different points. Kassel, Hercules, Statue of Liberty, American independent war and uh, at the end, uh, the Statue of Liberty was the key, and uh, was something like the bridge between all those different things. 
So it was just a sculpture part. It was a nice sculpture part, a conceptual sculpture part, at the end with uh, old pieces somewhere more like uh, figurative because it was how the originals were also. He got uh, original design drawings from the Museum of the Statue of Liberty. And uh, because also after uh, nine, after, uh, uh, how, how do you call it again? 9-11, after 9-11, it's so long ago that you forget how it's, how it's meant, how it's called, but after 9-11, uh, the Americans made a new uh, scan of the Statue of Liberty in order to know how it was put together in terms of, in, in case that it might become also a goal for, uh, by terrorism, a target for, for, for terrorism. And like I said, we had only half of the whole sculpture and the last half we had by uh, uh, by lending uh, all pieces of copper in the same amount of, uh, of what the last half also would stand for. So the Statue of Liberty is about 31 tons, I think, and uh, we had here like uh, 15 tons of copper, and we had also 15 tons of copper in the form of the Statue of Liberty. So the whole piece was in a way there. The whole copper, the whole of copper was, was there. And on the copper was a writing machine, a typing machine, which uh, we uh, we bought. That was our only production costs for the exhibition. And this is the original typing machine of Ted Kaczynski, of the so-called Unabomber, who uh, was uh, one of the first uh, American terrorists, so to say, if you if you can call it like that. Uh, after uh, after he did this, he uh, he sent those uh, those uh, letter bombs to to people. Um, in terms of like uh, protesting against the, uh, the, 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 the way science was taking, uh, taking hostage of, the, of our society, so to say. He was kept, uh, he, was, uh, he was after a long time, they, 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 they found him and he is uh, still in prison, I think, Ted Kaczynski. And uh, this typing machine was a typing machine on which he wrote his big manifest, which he sent to newspapers uh, in order to uh, use it as a way of, uh, of telling, if, if you're not going to stop this, if you're not going to take this serious, I go on in, 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 in murdering and uh, what happened. And this typing machine was uh, sold and on, on an auction by American uh, uh, FBI agency, uh, uh, an agency linked to the FBI, and uh, we were able to buy it for Yavo for, I think, 15,000 uh, euro. It's, uh, it's auctioned in, in the US. They auction pieces which are part of crimes and, and things. Pretty terrible in a way, but. <laughs> so it's, it also was a relation, again, to the Statue of Liberty and to this, uh, this thing. We wrote at the end the invitation cards on this, uh, we typed the invitation cards on this <laughs> typing machine. And uh, here, is the, here is the original, uh, by the way, which is not, was not part of the exhibition, but the original uh, way on which uh, the original uh, screenshot in which you see how the deal was made by, uh, by buying this, uh, this typewriter by Ted Kaczynski. So, just to make clear that for the Friedrichianum, I was able to change the Friedrichianum into a, into an, I was able to find the clue to the institution by the performative aspect of what you put in Christoph Büchel. And I was able to use that as a, as a red line for the, whole, uh, for the whole four years that I was doing the Friedrichianum. And uh, for me, that goes back a bit to the, to the 90s when I was starting my museum career at uh, Migros in Zurich, Migros Museum in Zurich, a company museum. And uh, it all started for me with the so-called relational aesthetics of those periods, of that period, with the way artists were working with active situations and were presenting art as an offer to participate with. 
which is revisited in a way also the last years, I would, uh, I would say, in, in some way. Rekker Tervanic, uh, yesterday we saw in Tirana uh, a text of Rekker Tervanic, when you're entering the city, you see a text on there. Was, the, whole uh, building was, huh? the whole building was painted by him, and the, the whole, text is part of that. Ah, the, the whole building was painted, okay, yeah. yeah. And um, he made a show with me uh, at Migros in 1998, two years after the opening of the museum, which was called Museum für Gegenwartskunst Zurich. We called it like that because we don't, didn't want to put the name of the company on it. And then after long discussions with Rick Ritt, he decided to make his show, his solo show in the museum, as a show in which he was uh, contextualizing Migros. He was making a supermarket out of the whole exhibition space. He was Because Migros is a supermarket chain, the biggest supermarket chain in, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, we were doing this Migros supermarket just as a real Migros supermarket with Migros products and with the help of the Migros uh, marketing people. And we were, uh, it was running, it was functioning as a supermarket the whole show. And at the same time, the show was called uh, Das Soziale Kapital, the social capital which used to be um, uh, a line which was always written uh, on, the, on the newspaper, which Migros also uh, uh, printed every month or every week. So Migros saw itself as a social company, uh, as a company with a very social target. And it was called the social capital that was something belonging to Migros. And uh, we mentioned it, we called the show like this because we, we found this uh, this sign in some storage at Migro, and it was also a connection to Joseph Beuys, of course, to the idea of the of the social plastic, which is also kind of a creative capital at some point, uh, of course. And the link between Rickrit and Beuys was a was a strong connection, I would say. And uh, the exhibition was a supermarket functioning as a supermarket, with the Migros logo you see at the left, uh, left part. Um, you could buy, not everything, it was not a huge Migros, but you could buy uh, a, lot of, a lot of products. Um, and at the same time, Rick Ritt mixed his own works in between. So there was also his bar, which he made in the, in the 90s, uh, Angst Essen Seele Auf, which goes back to uh, the idea of a film of Fassbinder, and uh, which was all about the system of uh, giving free beer and free coke to everybody. So there was a lot of offers. That was the social aspect of the exhibition and the communicative aspect of the exhibition. There was a piece by Douglas Gordon, this reading room, which was on the front, which was part of the Migo collection. Then there was this uh, curry kitchen, which goes back to his first curry kitchen exhibition at 303 Gallery in New York, and uh, with free curry every afternoon. There was this, uh, this music rehearsal box in which uh, bands could uh, come and, uh, and, uh, and perform and, and rehearse. There was this uh, car of his, which was uh, not an art, which was an art piece already. Bon Voyage, Monsieur Ackermann. He had this car together with uh, Franz Ackermann, the painter from Berlin, and they drove to exhibitions with it. And they drove to Zurich, and uh, during the whole show in Zurich, two Bavarian car mechanics were redoing the car. So this was an ongoing performance, and they took out the engine, they put it in again, and they repainted, uh, re-lacquered uh, the car, and so the car became is this an Ackerman? even... Huh? Is this Ackermann? No, it's not Ackermann. It's a friend of Franz Ackermann from the same village in Bavaria, in Bavaria where he was, he was born, Alt Hütting. And they, those two guys were there for the whole... But he looks a bit like Franz Ackermann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those guys were there performing the whole uh, exhibition, and at the end, as Mikro, we bought the car as an art piece. <laughs> it was in perfect shape then, and we had the, the idea with Rickard that when you use it for shows, we drive it there. We drive on the road, and the car was still uh, driving, and I think now it's not driving anymore. But uh, um, And in the car, which were always free video cameras, and they were taping everything, so when the car was moving from one place to another, it was shooting 
road movies, and the road movies were shown in the um, in the museum then. This was the concept of the car, and also in the back of the car there was a, a curry kitchen, a small curry kitchen to make curry, uh, Thai curry on the, on the way, which was the symbol, the metaphor of record at the end for the idea of the nomadic artist and uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of, the, um, of art as an offer, of art as a participative offer of the relational aesthetics. Then I showed that uh, 98 at Migro and with the idea of having Migro being thematized by the exhibition as, a, as an ongoing performance it made it able for us to also change the name from Museum für Gegenwartskunst Zurich into the name of Migro Museum. Migro Museum für Gegenwartskunst Zurich, which was for me at the end the far better uh, name of the institution because it was making it more uh, different than other institutions. It gave, it made it, as soon as the institutions got a name, it, it's something more human in a way. It's something more uh, communicative in a way. And uh, it's still called Migro Museum, although the commercial Migro first said we don't want to, want to be called Migro Museum, but the idea of the artist coming up with this idea was at the end the thing which was the, uh, the best argument. So we changed the institution, the performance of Recreative of Anija performed the institution and changed the institution. The artist as a change manager, in a way. I mean, I should not cry this out for loud, this idea of the artist as a change manager, but there's something in it, is it? And six years later, I was working in Rotterdam in a big museum there. I was not director, but uh, uh, exhibition director, Museum Boymans of Wöningen, which is a general art museum, more an encyclopedia kind of art museum with old masters and contemporary art with design and uh, everything. And uh, there, we came up with the idea of doing the first retrospective of Rick Retira of Egypt, of doing the first retrospective of this performative-based art. And we did it together with the, with the Musée d'Art Contemporain in Paris, where Hans Ulrich Obris was still working as a curator, and he was changing to go and work for Serpentine Gallery in London. So we made it a tour at the three institutions at the end. And we made a sort of different concept for all three institutions. But before we did this, we discussed in a workshop together with Rick with how we would be able to make a retrospective of uh, an artist who is creating performative work and who is creative changing work, which is changing all the time, which is contextual and which is uh, at the end defined by a certain situation at a certain venue at a certain time with certain people sitting on that table eating their curry and discussing about a certain topic. So it's not easy to turn that into just a performance, into just a retrospective by just putting the furniture in the room or something. And then we uh, came up with, a, with another concept. And Rick Ritt, uh, came up with the concept of rebuilding the uh, museums in which um, the, the museum spaces or the gallery spaces in which his seminal, his iconic pieces had taken place and making kind of a, a tour, a kind of commented tour, which was uh, going partly through loudspeakers in the, in the different uh, rooms, but also on headphones in, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the foreigners, for the, for the English-speaking uh, people, and also by um, an artist um, or an, uh, a tour guide who was going through the exhibition with, uh, with groups of people. And this tour guide was explaining what took place at that point of time. He was redoing the narrative. He was re-narrating the narrative of the situation in which the first curry kitchen was shown at Free of Free Gallery, or in which, um, like on the right side, the Kurdish Kunstverein, like it uh, looked in uh, the facade, looked in uh, 1995, in which the first time there was a, a show of regret which was open 24 hours a day and in which people could also sleep in a remake of the apartment of the artist. 
So all those stories were told by the people. So there was nothing to see in a way, only the capsules in which it took place, but the rest was only there in terms of words and in terms of, uh, of, 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 of a guided tour. So a very conceptual retrospective which kind of kept the idea alive of uh, something nomadic and something being able to, uh, to, to not only take shape in concrete form, but uh, being revived as a narrative and as an idea and as something which um, can be interpreted every time again and again. Good day. Uh, this We're about to begin a tour of the retrospective of the Thai artist Vekrit Tiralanich. For the retrospective exhibition, the artist and the curator, Rain Voice, have made a this selection the, of works uh, audio guide. which are more or less highlights <laughs> of Tiralanich's oeuvre, beginning in the year 1989 and working its way through to 2002. We will follow a route through an exhibition where the possibilities have been contemplated and focused into actions of the mind. On view, you will see no work, no object nor installation of objects frozen in time, fixed as if preserved for posterity. Rather, you will see nothing. So this was the idea, and uh, it's, like I told you, it was a general art museum, but it, must be. it still is, like also the museum I'm working now, I'm directing now at the Bundeskunsthalle, is also very broad, and of course you have a lot of visitors who come with different expectations in those spaces. They don't come there as they come to a Kunstverein and they know exactly now we're going to see a show of Rickert or Van Nietzsche. Now there are 20,000 people just passing by and opening the door and seeing here is nothing, only wooden spaces and a tour guide, which made it was quite tough to, uh, to put it there, but at the end uh, it, uh, it functioned for 50% of the people, it functioned, and for the other 50% it was like something, don't forget this. But this you can do in a museum in which there are other, mu in a big museum in which you have uh, a lot of other contexts, of course. So there were other shows taking place at the same time, and there was uh, uh, not only Rick Ritz, uh, retrospective. Um, I go through a bit faster now because uh, I step back to Migro shortly because I did that show with uh, Rick Ritz and then. Uh, Two years later, I did that show with Mauricio Catalan, and uh, the show was called La, Revo La Revolution de Noi, which is a quote by Joseph Beuys. And uh, the show looked at the first sight only like this. The whole first space in which uh, normally there were walls, brick walls, dividing this space into uh, more spaces, you still see it on the lighting pattern on the uh, on the on the ceiling. This whole space was empty, and the brick walls were gone. The walls we had built like uh, four years before, four years before, were gone, and uh, the space was completely empty. Only the second space, when you at the left side you go down the stairs, was filled or somewhat filled only by one small piece, and that was this piece. Uh, in which uh, Mauricio Catalan made a, a wax figure of himself, looking a bit younger than, uh, and, and dressed in a felt suit by Joseph Beuys. So the revolution at the end was that he destroyed kind of the infrastructure of the museum. We destroyed an investment of about 200,000 Swiss francs in those years, which the walls which we had built um, were destroyed. But creating a better situation with that at the end. He changed the museum completely. He changed the museum completely and turned, it, it, turned the big hall at the front into a, a, a hall. He, he brought it back to where it came from. 
and since then we were able to work with flexible walls and did not have to work with those brick walls which were uh, too fixed and uh, not always functioning. So the artist kind of performed the institution and changed the institution. Rickard changed it in terms of the idea of the institution and in terms of the name and in terms of the way people look at the institution, in terms of the communication. And Catalan turned it uh, into something else in terms of the uh, physics of the institution, in terms of the physical structure and the spatial structure of the, uh, of the institution. And the same kind of thing I could do on a small scale two years later with him in Rotterdam at the Boymans, uh, where we just saw the, 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 the Rickrit show. And it's only one piece, it's still there. It was supposed to be there only for half a year. Um, and this is, uh, we did it in 2002 in the, in the monumental part of the, of the building in which the old masters and uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century art is normally uh, installed. And that was this piece where we were able, after long discussions, to make a, a hole in the floor. And um, having Mauricio Catalan peeping out of the floor and, uh, and watching how the, how the old masters, or in this uh, case, the 18th century painters, did it. So the young Catalan looking at uh, the masters around him, kind of. And, uh, it was, uh, it was a very difficult, uh, difficult thing to bring through against the whole, uh, against the whole uh, amount of staff of the museum, specifically against uh, the other curators and against the people who were taking care of facility management, the building, etc. But at the end, it's, uh, it turned into some kind of a logo of Boymans afterwards, and it's still there, and uh, they seem to love it. <laughs> And for me, it was changing the situation, changing the museum, because it's kind of it's kind of a, a stone which is lying there and uh, which you don't notice, and all of a sudden you become aware that there is a stone lying and there is something in your way. It it, it changes the way you're looking at the whole uh, parkour there. It changes the rhythm in which you are walking uh, past the paintings hanging there as if they are hanging there like always in the same way. It is something which gives another consciousness of, uh, of, the, of the, um, <clears throat> the reception of the, uh, of, the, of the museum. Then I came to, uh, to Bundeskunsthalle, so I don't have that much anymore, only a, a few more slides. I came there in 2013 after I've left uh, Friedrich Arnhem and uh, I had planned a show with Jon Bock, the German artist, to do at the Friedrich Arnhem but I was not able to do that there anymore so I did that in uh, Bundeskunsthalle and it was uh, for Bundeskunsthalle an interesting show because it was the first time that they had a show which was so uh, uh, performative and so much like changing the aesthetics of the institution. Bundeskunsthal is a federal institution. It's the only federal Kunsthalle, the only federal art center, so to say. And we were just built in Bonn, just at the end when Bonn was still the capital of Germany. And uh, they started building it uh, three weeks before the war came down in Berlin. And uh, Three weeks later, probably they wouldn't have built the institution in Bonn and waited until it, they could build it in Berlin. But it's still functioning uh, uh, quite well, I would say. And uh, I, uh, uh, it's a building very near. It's an institution very near to politics, and it's an institution which uh, has a very broad view of, uh, on the one hand, art exhibitions but contemporary, classic modernist, old masters, everything. And on the other hand, also cultural history, larger uh, projects on countries and on uh, different sites, also archaeology, also design, fashion, uh, also film, uh, music. We do next year also a Goethe exhibition and a Beethoven exhibition. So it's a very broad idea of, uh, of, uh, of, making, of, of showing uh, exhibitions we called basically the Art and Exhibition Hall of the Federal Republic of Germany. And uh, we are not only an art center, but also an exhibition center. And that gives us the possibility of working on different uh, levels. 
The Young Buck exhibition, I just showed a few, few slides, were one of the first ones I could uh, be responsible for there, and it was a kind of uh, the first uh, retrospective of his, in which we had several um, active uh, situations and also props of, um, of films which he made in his uh, particular aesthetics. And during the exhibition, um, you see on the floor like this track for, uh, for uh, filming. During the exhibition, he was making a new film with his own props and with his own history, so to say, which turned out into a, uh, into a, to a new movie, which was shown at the end then. And so the, the museum was, the show was quite often a very active situation in which the props were, during the opening times, used for shooting the new film, so to say, um, from which I don't have pics now, I must admit. So a very active situation, which was for me the way to show people that we also should think a bit difficult about the Bundeskunsthalle as what uh, the, uh, the structure was up till then. Um, I told you we, only sh we also show other exhibitions. And we, for instance, we did a retrospective uh, two years ago on uh, the choreographer Pina Bausch, who created the dance theater, uh, something in between dance theater and performance art uh, at the end. And uh, we showed that at Bundeskunstler and also at uh, Gropiusbau in Berlin. And uh, on one hand, we showed uh, a lot of archive material a lot of uh, photos, a lot of uh, videos, also those, uh, this furniture which you see is props from a very famous piece of her, uh, Café Müller, uh, which is like a seminal piece of her. Um, and what we also uh, did, uh, we showed of course documents, etc, etc, et we showed everything, every piece, every uh, uh, performance is being taped, more or less. It's all being digitalized now in the uh, in the uh, archives, and it's uh, it's uh, they're working on the dance archive in Germany, which is supposed to be the Pina Bausch archive. And uh, it was interesting to do this whole thing to make this whole kind of documentary um, show. But the most important thing at the end, also, we did in a, a big room. We had. Uh, uh, six or seven screens next to each other on which we had uh, uh, different performances on different uh, days and in different settings and a different uh, so we had a whole orchestration of, uh, of different pieces of her um, which went in a loop for about one hour and uh, but what was most important this also but what was most important that we also were able to rebuild the rehearsal stage on which she, uh, she, she died herself in 2009, but the company is still going on. And um, we uh, rebuilt the rehearsal stage in which she rehearsed together with the company since the 70s, which was an old cinema in Wuppertal, which is about an hour away from Bonn. And we were, uh, we were reconstructing this uh, cinema room one-to-one, -one, on a one-to-one -one basis uh, in terms of aesthetics and in terms of dimensions. And it was a performative space for the whole exhibition. And it was a, for me, it was a performative mediation place because we didn't uh, make guided tours in the exhibition. We didn't give an audio guide, but we wanted the people to be uh, part of a, of a performative kind of mediation program. So we had... Uh, most of the times, uh, every hour we had, uh, in between we had a uh, film screening there in which you could see how Pina Bausch was rehearsing with her company and how the piece came, the pieces came into, became pieces in a way. So the, the let's say, the, the production process of the artist, so to say. And um, uh, this was the outside at uh, Gropius Bau. Uh, we also have here the, uh, the vitrines and the photos, etc. But I go back to the uh, to this uh, rehearsal stage, the so-called light Lichtburg, as it's called in German. And uh, we had the uh, dancers of the company, old dancers of the company, former dancers of the company, every hour to do uh, to do uh, uh, let's say dance 
tricks with the um, or the pieces of dance of Pina Bausch together with the visitors. So everybody was able to participate in the uh, in a Pina Bausch performance, a very easy performance in a way. It's a very famous thing. The people walk behind each other and they all make a few movements. And this was the basis of the dance theater. So the understanding of the show came by doing the show in a way and by performing uh, in a Pina Bausch kind of way. And this is, I think, for the future, something in terms of the mediation program for an institution becomes more and more important. We more and more we need the experiential approach in terms of the one-sided uh, guided tour experience. And we have to change the way in which we mediate between the exhibition and the, uh, and the audience, the public. We also had performances and dance performances taking place in that, uh, in that rehearsal place. But it was basically used as a rehearsal room together with the public, with the audience, the visitors. And then the last exhibition we had, which was a performative exhibition, that was a, a retrospective of Marina Abramovic, which is traveling for Europe. It was first in Scandinavia, then with us, and uh, next uh, later this month it will be opened in uh, in Firenze in the Palazzo Strozzi, and uh, it's called the Cleaner, and. Uh, it's a real retrospective, and we were uh, showing the the work she did together with um, with Ulai in the uh, in the eighties, the late seventies and the early eighties. We showed the work before she was working with Ulai, and we also showed the later work. And we show a lot of um, video pieces, video documentations. We show a lot of photos. We show installations. We show sculptures. And we show, of course, also uh, performances as re-performances. So when you see this famous, iconic performance in Pondrabilia, which she did in Italy in 1997, in 1977, together with Ulai, <coughs> when they were both standing in the doorway of the gallery, and every visitor to the gallery in which there was taking place a performance uh, show, Every visitor during the opening evening had to go through the two naked uh, Ulai and, uh, and Marina. And uh, we had this piece being re-performed by younger performance artists during the whole exhibition. So every day there were two people standing there and every day you could walk through. You had of course also, like she already had in the US performance at MoMA in 2010, also a second way to not go through this. And there is also always a discussion, should you give this second possibility? And I think, I think when we speak about the performance, I think it's necessary to do this. Because you want people to see the whole retrospective. And you want people to see the retrospective in the order you want to make this show also in kind of a chronological order. So it was, we didn't want to exclude people who don't dare to go through. Although a lot of people went through. But in Scandinavia, more people than in Germany. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, there are uh, different people and different, uh, different courages, so to say. <laughs> it's a real passage, I, I must say. I, I, if, you, if you plan to be in Florence or probably also in Belgrade in next year she will do a big retrospective, try and go through mm -hmm. if it's there because it's, it's a kind of interesting read the passage. And uh, just before the opening um, she did together with Ulai, who is in a very bad shape one has to say, is very ill, uh, but they did a performance, they, they re-performed one performance themselves only for about 10 minutes, but this is normally like uh, an hour or an hour and a half. It's uh, a tango pose, and at the same time there's a lot of, uh, there's a very loud tango music uh, in the space. This is in the open courtyard with us, but this was only with the preview public, and for us it was also a surprise that they were doing this, because it was supposed to be done by re-performers, and then they came together and they 
they did this, which was a touching moment, one has to say. And um, then we had this piece, which he uh, made after the period with, uh, with uh, Ulai, and she did it in 2002 for the first time, and for the only time in Sean Kelly Gallery in uh, New York, House with the Ocean View, in which she lived for uh, 12 days at night in the three uh, uh, cubes which are hanging on the wall there. And she couldn't come down. There are those uh, those uh, knives with the, the sharp blades uh, to the top. And uh, the only thing you could do there was drink water and like take a shower, like go to the toilet and uh, and like lie on a bench. And she did it uh, 12 days and 12 nights in 2002. And uh, with us, the first we had the first time this was re-performed by a young performer and a Swiss performer. She did this also uh, for 12 uh, days and 12 nights. House with the Ocean View, in which the public, the audience, is the ocean at the end. And the house is up there. And uh, this uh, was important to redo. And the way... There's a question, of, we had a lot of discussions, can you do re-performances? Is it, isn't a performance something like we had with Ritrit, the idea of, of redoing it by retelling the narrative, so to say. With Marina Abramovic, the re-performance is part of her so-called Abramovic method. And that is uh, the re-performance, we had about 35 of them were casted by the choreographer of Marina Abramovic during a few days casting process. And then two or three weeks before the opening of the exhibition, they went into a uh, retreat for um, five or six days in which they were not eating, they were only drinking tea, and they were doing a lot of uh, concentration uh, and other meditation trainings, which is called the Abramovic method. And, uh, well, this is, this is, by the way, the performer who was doing the, uh, redoing the performance, and Marina there also uh, um, uh, meeting her during uh, the second day of this re-performance. She was also not able to speak, so this is uh, quite a tough performance at the end. But this, what we see, was also part of the exhibition, this big table with rice and lenses in which, uh, lenses in which you can can participate as, uh, as, uh, as, as visitors, uh, which is also part of the Abramovich method, like just concentrating and focusing on something and in terms of kind of a training for endurance, hmm? which is a, a, a method which she works with a, a lot. So the, so she was the, the re-performers are very much trained. They were counting the, the rises? Or? Me? No, no, they, they were count, you can do what you want. Okay. You have you have all those rice corns and the len lenses there, and you can do what you what you can you can make uh, separate. Uh, you can count them. You can sort them out. You can make a figure out of them. You can just sit there for an hour or two hours or half an hour, and you can just focus on it. And you have a, a headphone on so that you don't hear anything from outside. You don't hear music, it's just like a block of, uh, like a sound block, in a way. And you have to give away your, your handies and your other uh, materials. Yeah, and for the rest we have uh, just to, to show three, four more pics and uh, to make it to an ending, because I was talking a lot about artist performance in the, uh, in the exhibition spaces, in terms of changing the institution and like uh, finding, uh, bringing a new air into the institution in a way, but also a new way of thinking about the institution, because the way you're working with human material, as I call it, at that point of time, you have to rethink about a lot of um, a lot of uh, pretty normal and pretty um, uh, non normally non uh, important uh, things and aspects of an institution. You have to think about another kind of security. You have to think about how to how to get along with the audience. You have to think about uh, how. Uh, 
how uh, also in terms of climatization, etc., etc. There is a lot of different things happening, and you have to deal with emotions, which is uh, something else than people watching uh, a painting show, so to say. And we have, apart from the museum spaces, we have a big auditorium for 600, for between 300 and 600 uh, people, and uh, we also do a. Um, uh, a performance and theater and music and film program there. And uh, we had last year, we had Adrian with, um, let's say, a kind of uh, video retrospective there uh, with talks in between. And we had, uh, two months ago, we had Hito Steil and uh, Rabin Brouwe with, uh, with a, uh, um, a lecture performance. So we are try and come up with pieces there which are always on the verge between performance, theater, art, visual art and, uh, and music. Like Makama Dance Theater from Lebanon with their production Baitna, which was also uh, very integrative at the end. Uh, but also bringing the smell experience to the museum, so to say, because it was about dancing, cooking, eating and, uh, and, and communication. Communication, or for instance, the Jerome Bell um, uh, production gala, in which uh, people out of uh, Bonn and Cologne were tested like uh, laymen, like not not uh, not normal, not dance people, not uh, theatre people, but normal, in between brackets, people to uh, do this uh, production to. To, to, to work on this production, to train, to rehearse this production during a week and then bringing it on the stage. Um, and uh, so these are things which, uh, uh, which uh, are uh, for us very important to give an other idea of a kind of traditional institution like Bundeskunsthalle. And at the same time, we still have the, the big cultural history exhibitions. We have the archaeological exhibitions and we have the normal contemporary art exhibitions also going on. Just to put it to an end, I, uh, I told a lot and I showed a lot of Christoph Büchel at the beginning because it's, I don't say it's the best uh, show I did, but it's the show in which I can tell the story the best because it's uh, changing, it was changing the institution on a very radical level at that moment. Um, there are some artists who, every time you, you need them for something, that's what I found out at some point of time, and sometimes you redo something with an artist in another institution. And uh, for instance, Rikrit Tiruvanija was somebody who became important as, uh, as, uh, as showing, as giving, as, 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 as developing an idea on an institution. He did that on Migro for me. He, developed an idea of how to get along with the idea of a retrospective for a kind of art which is not fit for being shown in a retrospective at one month. And at, uh, me, at Friedrich Channel we did something very simple. He, he recreated a piece which was already uh, functioning as a piece on different levels for him. He just made a wall drawing, uh, less oil, more courage. And uh, for me this was... Uh, in those years in Kassel, um, there was a big discussion going on between us as a Kunsthalle and between the, the Hessian State Museum. And the director of that museum, the general director of that museum, was also the one who was responsible for works which were bought by the city of Kassel out of documentas. And he once said about his uh, own idea of art, he said, we don't want to buy art which fits in the power supply, but we only want to go on with the tradition of painting. So no media art which comes out of the power supply, uh, in, for which we need electricity or whatever, no other media, we only need to go on with oil painting. And for this, this piece with Rick Retira Van Ech, uh, which you can interpret on several levels, uh, was also the level of less oil painting and more courage in terms of attitude and in terms of uh, trying to find an attitude. Because I think since Joseph Boys, we live in an era in which we as curators, but also artists, we all have to think 
about every time again to find an attitude towards the world, towards society, towards the audience, <laughs> and towards also very practical towards the existing material substance of the museum. We need to find an attitude in order to be able to function, in order to be able to become relevant and to stay relevant, and in order to be able to communicate. And I think that's what, uh, what is needed, and that's the best lobby for the future of the museum, um, in, my, uh, in my opinion. So I thank you very much for uh, holding through with me. And, uh, Thank you, Ryan, very much. Any question? Oh, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. Um, you had the possibility today and yesterday, maybe, to talk with museum directors or gallery directors from Kenya and um, Museums in Albania um, surely face other challenges than those in Germany. Um, what do you think? What are common challenges? Common challenges. Common challenges are that we that more than in earlier days, probably in a lot of different countries, we have to justify ourselves and to have we have to make clear why 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 society needs us, because the situation is changing. The, I, I, I know the situation very well in the countries where I've worked. I know it very well in, in, in Germany, in Holland, and in Switzerland. And in all those three countries, I saw, I saw the, the way, the role of the museums in society change enormously during those years. Well, we see Germany right now. There's changing a lot in public opinion. There's changing a lot in terms of uh, the way people think about political correctness and the way people think about uh, the way uh, integration should take place or not should take place. And I think the museum is a political institution. The museum should not be a political instrument, but, the politi but the, I think the museum should play a decisive role in the, in the political societal debate, and that is uh, that's the same. The, the same goes for Albania. The same goes for um, for Germany. The same goes for uh, for Italy and for and for France and wherever I would say. And this is different than than in earlier days. We are not. It's not only about beauty and about. Uh, and this, 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 I mean, this is this gives us also responsibility for the for the contents. And that we that we say for a part that we say partly goodbye to a, to a traditional uh, thinking in terms of aesthetics about uh, about the harmonic uh, the harmonic art piece, and that we think about also the possibility of integrating other pieces and, and mediating them to the to the audience, because mediation is. I would say since about 12 years, I think since the document of 2007, mediation became part of the content of the museum, and not only as a surface-oriented uh, situation. We need mediation in terms to survive, in terms to survive as a as, as a museum, because otherwise we can't uh, make clear why we are needed, because our traditional audience which is in Germany the Bildungsbürger, the, 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 the intellectual, uh, somewhat older uh, uh, person who, uh, who has an academic background. And uh, this, this, this kind of people won't exist anymore in the future, or they will have other, uh, they will have other uh, targets in, in, their, in the, the way they, uh, they design their life. So I think there is a lot in common, but we all, we have difficult starting points in Albania or in uh, or in Germany, and we have diff different financial uh, support and different uh, different uh, conditions in that sense. But uh, yeah, but I don't know if we and the ability of creating uh, what is it utopic page kind creating utopias. Yeah. 
artistic ones. But I, I don't know if the museums, I mean, if, if you mean that in Albania museums have less freedom, I, I don't know. I, I mean, we have to be very careful also in, in Western Europe that we take still care of artistic freedom as something in museums and that we don't let, I mean, I remember it from Holland, and, and you see it also taking place in Germany a bit. At some point of time, you get funding, but you get funding more and more on certain conditions. You get funding only when you have a good marketing uh, plan and you have a good mediation plan, and this costs so much money that you you, you don't get better again from this from this funding which you're getting. You only get you get funding not for the content itself, but for the other aspects which are circling around the content. And this is a, a danger for museums. Because it, it doesn't make the artists better, you can't make them, you can't pay them more fee or something. It's, it's all about the other um, aspects of the museum which you get more funding for. But in Albania, probably there's a possibility of, of, of finding some new ways because you can't compare it with what was before. And this is, can also be a chance. Yeah, basically, I mean, we have a lot of money problem here. I mean, and I can imagine that the show of Catalan in the Negros Museum was costing a lot. Just to break down these, uh, to, to the walls was a lot. Well, I imagine it would have been expensive. It was not so expensive. The show of Christoph Buchel in Kassel was more expensive. But then I could only do one show in that year, so I could use a whole year, yearly budget. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also always a matter of where you put the money. I mean, like when I came to Bundeskunstler, I said to the, to the people, in the f at, at some point of time, in a few years' time, I want to see here yeah, more money going to the human aspect, to people, than go to uh, transport companies and to uh, and to insurance companies. And this is uh, also when when you work more with performative art, or when you work more with living artists, or when you work more with uh, also with uh, film or video artists. It's sensible when you can put more in the production and when you don't need all the money for shipment uh, for, for, for Hasenkamp and DHL and for uh, those kind of companies, but when you can put it in, into people and into, into production. But this is traditional museums still have the idea that we, we only think in terms of, uh, of, 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 of exhibitions which are based on loans. And this is and the loan, the, the, the whole loan traffic is a very expensive uh, uh, traffic these days and becomes more and more expensive. Less showcases more people. <laughs> <laughs> but still not throwing, away, throwing out all the showcases because we still need to keep, uh, we still need to be very much precise with uh, cultural heritage, and we need that. <coughs> yeah, because also, I mean, these um, these gestures and these performances, somehow they have to relate to the museum as an institution to yeah. take their <coughs> their strength somehow. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you can go in a supermarket, you can go in a supermarket, and you, yeah. you keep going in a supermarket to buy your stuff. Yeah. But it's because the supermarket entering the museum that somehow it starts kind of tension which is def different. So somehow the museum mm -hmm. itself as an institution, but also the, the idea of the museum as a space where you go to encounter the culture, to encounter the heritage, to encounter this kind of, to celebrate somehow mm -hmm. the idea of beauty or the harmony. And these two realities, when they come together, they produce a kind of tension. Otherwise, yeah. you know, it's just just for market. Yeah. Like everywhere. And also, it's it's, it's it's somehow to bring the Duchampian idea, you know, to the to the biggest. I uh, mean, okay. somehow, 
level, you know, to, to, to transform, yeah. not, just, not just to bring an object in an art gallery, but to bring the whole mechanism inside another mechanism, mm -hmm. you know, and to create this kind of uh, tension and this kind of, uh, um, yeah, to, to, to remix somehow the identities of, of it's, it's weird. I, I, I was responsible for two supermarket shows with Christian Buchan and with uh, Tira Vanich, but there are a lot of, I mean, Jens Harden made a supermarket show once, and there are like five, six, seven, eight artists who made supermarket shows. It's, uh, and right now there was something at the Wiesbaden Biennial also, as a, as a supermarket for one week in the, in the theater uh, in Wiesbaden. So it seems to be a good metaphor for, uh, for something. But what I also would like to say, that's also, in, in terms of museums, I spoke with uh, Luciano, uh, Luciano. Luciano yeah, about the photo museum, and, and tomorrow we do a visit also, and I think also for those kind of museums, we should also think about, about the original and the way we, we deal with the original in future, in terms of uh, some media, in terms of photos, sometimes it's... Uh, it's not always necessary to, to work with the vintage print and to work with the original because we can we have perfect techniques of showing a, an exhibition copy also which has a lot of advantages you pay less <coughs> insurance for that you pay uh, less uh, in terms of climatization for it you can show it with 120 lux instead of with uh, 30 or 60 lux and so you can create another kind of uh, uh, display situation, and it's cheaper in transport, etc., etc., and it, and, I mean, there are still people chasing, chasing the original like crazy, but for some media, we, we need to think more and more in terms of, of copies also. Why do we want to send everything across the whole world in terms of, and, and, and the whole, uh, environment uh, uh, problem which we have with that. I mean, I think it's perfectly sensible. As long as you as you write to it, it's an exhibition copy. Why not? And you can also take it out of the history and reposition it, and yeah. you maybe create new meaning. In you are much freer to work with that with that copy than with the original in that sense. And at the end, it goes it goes about uh, what do you want to say with an exhibition. And how do you want to make a, a, an, an inter how do you want to make a, 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 a situation which is functioning, and not only the cult of the original, which is a bit old-fashioned also in a way, but we still need the Mona Lisa in original, and we, <laughs> and we don't accept the copy behind the plexiglass, which probably it's a copy. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you again. Yeah.